Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Judson, welcome to the show. Yes. So you're, you're a Southern guy, huh? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in, here in Alabama and uh, been around a little bit, but this is mostly where I call home. Yeah, you were, you were telling me that uh, things like NASA and, and places like that are down there? Yes, I'm currently living in uh, Huntsville, which is uh, you know, a big technological center here in the northern part of the state of Alabama. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty progressive town. That's awesome, man. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, as a as an artist, you're a very unique artist that we're having on. Primarily, I deal with a lot of um, painters, and I guess technically, you could call yourself a painter. But what is it exactly that you do? Well, these days, uh, I pretty much am highly specialized as a glass painter. I think traditionally you know, for stained glass windows. And it's a very old art form that, you know, started in the Middle Ages and pretty much has not changed a lot since then. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I'm, I mostly do a lot of drawing and painting for the windows though, mm -hmm. nowadays. That's awesome. And, and we'll get a little bit more into that um, because, uh, <clears throat> years and years ago, I used to uh, apprentice under a stained glass uh, artist. And when I saw your work, I was like really, really blown away. And, um, and I wanted to ask you a couple – I'm not an expert or anything like that uh, in stained glass, um, but I know how to do it. I have appreciation for it. Um, but your kind of stained glass uh, – I almost feel it's very different and 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 uh and so I wanted to see if it is and then like if there's a different technique or approach to what you're doing um if there's different types of approaches to stained glass. So um but before we get into that conversation, but what what are you currently working on in your in your studio? Well, I uh I, I do work for another studio that is out of Nashville, Tennessee. Mhm. Mm uh, they are heading up this entire project. You know, it's so much work involved that really, you know, just one person just can't hardly do it by themselves. Uh, I have experience, you know, I have done all aspects of stained glass from just building windows to, you know, everything. But uh, here over the last few years, I've decided, you know, to, you know, target myself more on the end of painting. So the studio that I work for, they will send me glass that's already cut out. I will paint those individual pieces and fire them in the kiln and hmm. all kind of crazy things until, you know, the, the work is finished. And then I take it and deliver it back to them. And, uh, you know, then they fabricate and install windows. And mm -hmm. they are actually on the design end. I mean, they work with the committee and once, you know, he will do the people I work for do, do the drawing themselves, like a little color rendering. And of course, once it's approved, then I take that rendering and and the way I look at it, I'm. They have a very specific style that they are hoping to see done, and that's where you know I work really well in is the old Munich style, which was popular back say from um, maybe the 1860s up until you know, through the Victorian period up till maybe like World War II. It was a very high style of Baroque uh, uh, 
they actually called it German Baroque. As mm -hmm. as well. But it's a very difficult style just because, you know, it's kind of realistic, but stylized to a degree. And uh, back during the day, they had, you know, master artists from the academies that drew the drawings and that's all they did, you know, and then it went down through a studio and like say the, their best and highest paid people were the flesh painters. And they were the ones that painted uh, the faces and hands. And then maybe it went to somebody else that did the draperies and someone else maybe did the inscription plates at the bottom or whatever. And so they had it down to a really tight studio process, but now, you know, the condition of stained glass is such that you're fortunate to have any kind of a big job. And if you get one, it's, it's almost like it's difficult to pay many employees, you know, because it's just so much labor in it. Hmm. And, and, and to this job that you have right now, um, how, how long do you think it will, it, it'll, it'll take to complete these windows? Well, it, it depends partly on the committee and how well they're together on what they're doing. Now, as of right now, I'm working on one church and there's like 60 windows. Wow. And this is for a Catholic church in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Hmm. And, um, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I love what I do and everything, but every day I wake up and I can't really answer your question. You know, it's all done by hand. It's all so specialized. Mm. Uh, you know, we kind of go through phases. It's almost like, you know, my employer, he will do drawings and sketches. And when he, and when he sends them to me for approval, then I do mine. And then it may be, you know, six weeks before I'm actually painting that window because they have to cut it out. And then yeah. I'm, I'm working on the one before that one. So, and then it comes in too as to, you know, the donors and people that pay for windows, sometimes they have an influence on which one comes next or whatever. So it could, so, it could be a, a multiple year project just for one oh, building. Yeah, I would, you know, I would guess for the situation that we have going on, you know, the studio I work for is a larger studio. And of course they have several you know, people on their end. But so far as the painting that I'm doing, it's just uh, very time consuming. I just completed a window that's one of the largest in the church. Hmm. And I've spent 12 weeks painting that window. Just painting Wow, that's awesome. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's just, you know, <laughs> this is not to be funny, but every day, you know, I wake up and I feel like I'm kind of on the cross of the way. It's like, you know, it's like <laughs> It just is it's so much work and, and it's like I said, everyone says, Well, why don't you hire somebody, you know? And then I've had some people, oh, they'd like to learn to do it just for nothing and just do it. But I'm really I'm just not set up to for that situation. And you have to be so careful with everything, you know. If you yep. sneeze on the work or do something before it's fired, you know, you've ruined hours worth of work. Yep. Or if you drop it in the floor and it's glass, it breaks. And, Mm. So, I mean, again, you know, once a window is put together and in its place, normally, unless somebody was trying to destroy it, nothing's going to happen to it. I mean, it's, it's there and it's in its place, but until then, you just have to be so careful with everything. So, mm -hmm. it makes it difficult to have employees. And again, also, it's just, as an artist, I'm trying to become more and more of a business person, but I don't believe I will ever be a master at that. You know, my yeah. thing is drawing and painting. And I think most artists would agree with that one. So. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> but uh, so it's, you know, again, even to have to keep up with having employees or anything like that would just be, I just can't even go there. You know, yeah. But, if you ever do go there, your first employee probably should be um a studio manager of some, you know, just so that they know what to do and then they can help, help create that business side of it where you can really just be focused on the, uh, the labor part of it and also maybe even the training part of it. But well, that the, would be ideal. Uh, you know, I was reading from one of the old, you know, stained glass <laughs> painters that lived back in the 1800s. Uh, he had written an old book and, 
it was kind of interesting after reading through the book, he says, I have now described the 17 different processes that go into the making of a painted glass window. And, you know, so it's like I said, there's just so many process, process. Mm -hmm. it's like with canvas painting or whatever, you can always, you know, you can kind of like cover up what you did if you don't like it. Well, on glass, it's transparent. So it's almost like you have one shot to do everything. Wow. You know, the way you want to, and it kind of works backwards to other mediums because you put down a wash of paint and then you go back and take away the highlights, mm. you know, brushes or needles or something else. So to me, it's just, you know, like with a drawing, I'm, I'm really super comfortable with. I started out in life to become a comic book artist. Really? I to get my <laughs> door, you know, it was just, you know, when I got out of high school, that was all I did. I got out of high school and that's what I really wanted to do, but I never could, like I say, get my foot in the door. And uh, so from that point, I just sort of started, you know, taking on anything that I could make a dollar or two at, you know, and started doing portraits and other things. And, wow. Could you imagine like, like, you know how they have like the hall of fame and things like that. Could yeah. you imagine if they had like a big church for comic books that when you walked in the stained glass windows were panels and comic books? <laughs> oh yeah. It's a, it's almost like stained glass in my opinion is almost like the ultimate pop art form. It's kind of funny how the two translate so well, because generally with comic books, you know, you have, sort of this pen and ink with heavier outlines around yep. the edge. Well, that's the same concept as stained glass, but the main difference in glass is that it looks different all the time, especially if it's in, uh, you know, natural lit situations. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, if you're facing west and there's, you know, go, the sun's going down outside, you know, the window, even if you have blues or greens or whatever color, but sometimes the window picks up these lovely pink tones and, you know, all this different thing. So it's almost like it works almost like a mood ring, I guess, if you will, you know, hmm. it constantly looks different. That's awesome. You go into any church building and you just sit there for a few minutes and, you know, maybe just sit there for an hour just watching the windows. It's like when the sun goes behind the clouds, it looks one way. And, you know, it just, if you really pay attention, you just see, you know, the movement and the windows and, and everything. Mm -hmm. So glass is a, a very special medium. And I believe these days, I think most of the call for it is, uh, again, you know, happens to be church windows, which none of us really know where the future of all that's going though because you know like i said as as usual our society is looking at more you know ways to do more mass produced type work and keep it more in budget that kind of thing so there's always now we can print on glass and you know most mm -hmm. people really don't know the difference but to my understanding, unless it's done in the traditional method where it's fired in a kiln and everything, then it's normally, as a rule, has not been shown to be permanent. Hmm. But we happen to be living in a world where people don't no longer really care about permanent anymore. It's, you know, a throwaway society. And, you know, if it lasts 20 years, oh, we've done great, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> You know, even a lot of the uh, windows over in places like England and other places, as I can understand it, they're, it's almost like they're wanting to take out those old, ugly, Victorian, you know, perfect window, you know, styles and everything and put in something new or, you know. And uh, I think across the globe, even though this is a more of a European type art form, I think across even in England and all, I think there are a lot of people struggling to get new work. You know, they mm -hmm. have all the old ones and there's always restoration work to keep up the old windows. But, uh, so it's, it's very difficult. I really believe the United States has probably got some of the larger studios. It seems like there are an awful lot of artists, which surprisingly to me were from Mexico. Hmm. Uh, in, uh, South America. And well, that would make sense. Probably because it's very highly Catholic. I'm yeah. Not sure, but, you know, uh, 
you know, but for whatever reason, you know, that seems to be a lot of that. But I believe during uh, the Victorian period, I think uh, England had something like, you know, England's about the size of Texas. I think they had something like 150 studios, stained wow. glass studios, and a lot of those were really large ones compared to today. Now you're lucky if you go into a stained glass studio and there might be, you know, if they have three employees, it's like, whoa, man, y'all rolling, you know? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so it's like, you know, but, you know, I think really, right, it seems to me like now I don't know of any major large studios that are in England anymore. Wow. I think most everybody is more like, okay, I'm working out of my garage or wherever, you know, and doing this work. And it seems well, I guess like you're saying because of the technology and also the mindset of a lot of artists is that they're that they're the singer songwriter that they're they're in control of the whole entire process where when most artists think of a studio they think of themselves in a studio and when you're talking about studio you're talking about an organization and a, a, almost like a factory in a sense you know um yeah the, again the older studios had it down to you know the the victorian age saw the industrial revolution and all and then yep. you know in order for them to do large cathedrals they would uh, again they had to have huge teams of people doing it and yes but yet a lot of people in today's mindset would look at that and think oh well that cheapens the work because they did you know they copied their same windows again and again and they're sort of like catalog windows, but when you look at those old windows, there's almost no one that can paint with the perfection, you know, that these guys did. I mean, mm -hmm. it's almost incredible. So they had it down to a very tight, you know, structure, uh, you know, uh, you know, of artists that did did the work and. For the type of work I do, like I said, I my main thing all my life has been drawing. I started when I was young and that's just all I ever wanted to do. So I developed my skills and I got good at drawing and uh, generally for the type of work we do, you have to, you have to have a good working drawing to copy from of some kind. We call ours a cartoon, which is from an old Italian word that means to copy from, a drawing to copy from. And once you have that drawing, then your goal is to take all these little puzzle pieces of colored glass, mm -hmm. reproduce that drawing, you know, pretty much onto glass. And so, again, so where do you, so does the studio that you work for, do they supply the, that, that cartoon or, or um, is that what you actually make? I do my, I pretty much do my own drawings mm -hmm. because I'm painting the work. And then I do, you know, the the painting on glass. So and then the studio, they're working with the client to come up with the concept, yes. and then they're art directing it basically. And then you're um, designing and, and 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 drawing it out to meet their criteria, and and then you execute it as well. Yes, because the studio that I'm working for, because they were the ones that got the job, they're the ones that heading up the whole job. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, they are in charge of, you know, dealing with the committee. And again, gotcha. he, he, does, he is considered the designer. I have to say, you know, usually in the art form we work in, there are many hands. If you were to look at a lot of old windows, a lot of times, well, like say a Tiffany window, for example, a real one. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always signed Tiffany Studios mm -hmm. because there were so many people. You had some people that specialty was selecting glass, you know, and the colors and the type of glass they were going to use. You know, there were so many hands and then, you know, that it went through. Somebody else might have been the one that put the window together, you know. You know, when somebody else installed it, so it's not like everybody, you know, was not allowed to just sit and sign a window, you know, oh, yeah, I did this. I did this. <laughs> Nowadays, I mean, I'm very fortunate, you know, we, uh, you know, I usually sign, sign the studio's name first, of course, and, you know, but I've been allowed to, you know, put my name on the window at the bottom, you know, as, the, um, you know, the, uh, at least doing the, you know, the painted scenes. Mm -hmm. So, 
I think just for a restor restoration aspect or anything else, I believe it's important because there's a lot of people that'll walk into a church and they'll say, oh, we've got real Tiffany windows. Well, if the window was not signed, there really is no way to validate that at all. You know, Indeed. I mean, because uh, there were people living back there in that time that worked for Tiffany and they had access to that kind of glass or something else, you know, and so you never know. They, uh, you know, they may or may not have done the, you know. That, that's actually a really um, b beautiful thought because the studio signs it and therefore it represents all the people in that it represents the entire team, not just one person or, or, or this or that. And so therefore by, by putting the stamp on there, they're, they're saying, yeah, you may, you know, John Smith over there may get the same materials, but what they don't have is the same team. It's the collection of minds and skills and people that make that, that unique soul of that company, right? And they're stamping that. And so you, someone else may grab the, the physical things and, and make a copy or, 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 or call it a Tiffany window, but it's really not a Tiffany window if the Tiffany team did not work on it. Yes, and funny enough, even, even say Tiffany, now he was a prolific artist and he was involved in a lot of the processes and even some of the chemical processes and how they made their glass and all of this thing. But somehow when you hear that word Tiffany window, well, you get this image in your head that Tiffany did all the work. And actually he had, you know, a lot of people you know, it was a huge studio and he had mm -hmm. a lot of people that did different parts of it. And some women were some of his best designers and mm -hmm. that type of thing. And, but again, you know, they're, they're little mention of them. You know, it's always, we hear Tiffany, Tiffany. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, I just have to say, it's just as it's a collaborative effort on everybody's part. It's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, one of these, Stevie Nicks, I guess, from Fleetwood Mac. I remember her saying something one time in an interview. She said, you know, they were asking her how it feels to let other people have your songs. Or, you know, I mean, you know, other people in the group. And she said, well, if they do you a good job, you're proud that you gave that part of yourself and you gave, gave it over. But if they, you know, if they, you know, do a horrible job, your baby, you know, and you're, you're, mm. and that is, it's a horrible thing, you know, and Indeed. that's the way I feel. I'm very fortunate to work for, again, a larger studio that, that does very excellent work. And even, even the guy that does the design work, he's uh, very, very good at designing. He's very good with talking with committees and dealing with that stuff. I have been on that end of things before, and I really, as an artist, it's just something that I would prefer somebody else to, because I mean, <laughs> really, it gets to be, you know, what do I want on my pizza, and, you know, one of them wants pepperoni, and the other one wants sausage, and, you know, it's like, oh, it yeah, would just kind of like drive me crazy. It's very yeah. difficult to get anybody, especially when you're dealing with several people, it's hard to get people. Indeed. But, it's uh, a it's a certain skill set and it, it, it requires a certain kind of personality. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, stained glass has been looked upon in times past. I think now it's becoming, in more recent years, it's being looked at differently. But early on, a lot of people would have said that it was more of a craft. Mm. Because, you know, anybody can learn to put together a window. But I think any, also, you know, you can look at, various works and I think anybody would realize right away what's a piece of art and what's a piece of you know a craft but because our our particular medium is set you know it really is it does its best job in an architectural situation so everything we do nearly is very custom and it has to be designed to fit into whatever space if a window is really tall and high you know then you know we have to cram all these people together and you know, make them fit into that space. Mm -hmm. So it makes it even difficult to even like reuse a lot of your old drawings. 
It's almost mm. like every drawing that's done is pretty much made for a certain client. And some of these that I'm working on are like donor portraits. You know, somebody's paid for the window, but they say, I want my uh, dad to be St. John. You know, so, <laughs> so I have to Very renaissance of them. Portrait, you know, and then, of course, you know, we usually fix them up in costume or whatever to kind of match the yep. character or whatever's going on, but... So it's just very, uh, and you know, a lot of times you're working from photos that are no good, you know, it's like, <laughs> you, know, you know, I've got a front view of the head and I'm needing to draw them from a side view of the drawing. So it makes it kind of difficult. And at one point you just roll with it and do the best you can, you know, and mm-hmm. everybody loves it. Now, when you say that uh, the, the guy designs it, does he design it from the perspective of like the architecture of it? Or is he actually designing the concept and the composition of it? Well, I think he comes in from both sides. Again, he knows how to do everything. But Mm -hmm. with stained glass, there is a lot to learn about structure and how to break up the pieces of glass so that they're, you know, they're able to stay in that setting for a long time. If you think about it, they're kind of heavy panels. And at one point, everything as it ages starts to sag. So... You know, generally, you know, you know, you have to you have to think in terms of design and everything, and how how to you know make it where you know will stay in its place for a long time without you know being prone to being cracked and broken as badly. If you cut pieces that are too weird shaped and things like that, well, yeah, we have saws that can cut out things now, you know, perfect, but. Usually, sooner or later, you know, that piece may be prone to crack just because it's such an odd-shaped piece, you know. Mm -hmm. In the old days, you know, the stained glass was the actual window. So it had to take wind and rain and usually Mm -hmm. the painting done to the inside of the windows. and That protected the painting. But I've, I've actually seen some old medieval windows up close that were... It's, it's amazing. It's almost like the glass was beginning to erode they were so old you could just see little holes in the glass and things wow. you know over the years you know the acid rain and different things but the painting was pretty well intact <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like it's kind of a strange art form yeah but you're so, sitting there looking at something that was from the 1400s and you think about that in your head it's like wow so so the the, the work that you work on the glass itself the art isn't necessarily made from different colored glass per se um and and i'm just throwing this out there and then you can correct me um where like in in one type of stained glass it's like you're just piecing all these different color pieces together to create let's say an image right um it, it it seems like your work you might be piecing large pieces of glass together but then you're actually just you're drawing on top of the glass and then painting the image on it right um am i correct in saying that yes okay that i find very fascinating very fascinating well the first and foremost i think you know the the reason to say for painting on glass or not painting on glass is I guess pretty much you're able to get details from a lot fewer pieces of glass. Uh, you know, you can you could paint on one piece and do a whole, say a whole row of flowers or vines on one piece of glass. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can paint, you know, some of the colors if needed or whatever, whatever the intent is. So uh, with glass painting, you know, we have to cut these pieces in simpler shapes. Like yes, if you're outlining a head, but or or something like that. But uh, you know, we fill in like the background shapes. We fill them in dark. Ah, uh, okay. So the structure or the lead. So when you look at the window, it's almost like wow. You know, it looks more like a painting. I've had a lot of people ask me. You know, that I used to have a public studio, and I had a lot of people would ask me, uh, "Is that painting on glass, or is that?" stained glass or what is that you know Mm -hmm. it's it's almost like they know it looks like glass but uh, it almost has i guess the purpose for painting on glass is to hold back the light 
you know, to degrees. It's almost every layer yeah. of paint is holding back the light just a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know? And the best painters really know how to do it. We're not trying to go for just paint 18 layers of paint to get it to look like canvas. Because then uh, it's gotcha. you know, it don't look like the medium it should look like. I mean, we want to kind of keep that translucency so we let a lot of light in. And, uh, you know, and there, there are just many different styles. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, like when you were saying, when you paint the head, the head, um, there's an image of the head that is hand painted. So it has the outline and the paint and that kind of stuff. But the piece of glass in which it's on might just be a very simple, let's say, uh, o you know, half oval shape of some sort, right? Yeah, so it's um, almost like you fill in that. I don't know if I'm making sense, but if you say you're drawing the ears and the profile, it's almost like you fill in, you know, the around the ears and those shapes. You can fill them in, you know, with a black pigment. And it's almost like, you know, when you once the window is leaded together, it's sort of, you know, you don't your face don't go to it. It's almost like you you know you see this proper image. Yeah. So it's almost like you're all, you're actually making a puzzle. So like on a puzzle, you have the image painted on, let's say, this cardboard, but then you cut these pieces out that ultimately are reassembled. But if done properly, you you see that it's assembled, but you're 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 really focused on the experience of the whole image coming together. Yes, it's almost like if you can imagine, it's almost like all of the light comes through the glass. Mm -hmm. The framework that's used around it uh, doesn't get any light. So it's almost like, you know, all of the light, it's almost like a, in a sense, like a flashlight, you know, shining through a window. So yeah. It's like all of the, and the, really our purpose is, it's almost like the best way to describe what we do is it's almost like, the reason it's broken up as pieces of glass is partly for the firing aspect. You know, once pieces get so big, it really gets difficult to fire those pieces without mm -hmm. breaking or cracking. And, ah, you know, that makes well, sense. Well, that's one thing. But the other thing is, it's almost like the glass itself is broken up in colors. And uh, so it's almost like the glass is, is actually your color up. And from mm -hmm. there, we are almost doing sort of a charcoal rendering onto the surface, you know, to create the shadows. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so that's, that's pretty much, you know, the process. It's almost like if you could think of in terms of like painting with, you know, a, a charcoal drawing on colored glass. That's basically, you know, most of the, most of the artists will use neutral browns or black tones. Mm-hmm just for the shading. Now, when it comes to things like faces, sometimes those are more complex and require a lot of extra firing. Sometimes we, you know, start out on clear glass and then I'll have to paint in the flesh tone and I'll paint the eye colors and the hair colors and mm -hmm. other things. So there are ways to paint, you know, on, you know, colors on the glass. But as a rule, we try to use the glass as much as we can. Indeed. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, I, and from a business perspective, uh, you know, I could see years and years ago and even today, uh, as an insurance policy, you would make it on smaller pieces of glass in case there was an accident. You didn't lose the entire project. You just lost that little piece. Yeah. And that's another reason, too. You know, you, anything can be painted. I've seen some windows across the world, just mainly in photographs, but I've seen <laughs> some of them that were you know, these had these immaculate faces and draperies and everything all painted on one big piece of glass. And now you can look at it and you'll see how there's a big crack all the way through the glass because the piece was either too large or too deep for cuts. Or, you know, and, then, wow. and you know, these windows have a certain heaviness. So even when they're in their place, eventually, you know, they usually have rebar that cuts across them in straight lines acting kind of like girders that hold them up. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like holding up the weight of the glass that's on top of it. So some of that you have to have. Usually yep. in my drawings, I keep them a little bit more like a full drawing. I don't always draw in every little, you know, uh, 
section where it's broken up into panels and things like that. But mm -hmm. I, I just feel like really it makes it more marketable should I ever get to that point where I can maybe sell prints or originals even. You know, it just makes mm -hmm. for a bit nicer piece of art. In the old days, a lot That's of smart. People, you know, would just draw these drawings and they would build their window right on top of their drawing and everything. The cartoons really were, you know, just kind of like laying around the studio and in a bucket in the back. <laughs> in the studio, bucket you know, in the back. It's like, you know, like I said, they're usually made one time. Some of them might be, you know, repurposed or reused, but the problem is every time you have windows with different dimensions or shapes, now you've either got to pull those figures apart if you were going to reuse it, you know, you got to make them fit their space here again. So it's sometimes difficult to, you know, just to reuse that one drawing over mm -hmm. and over. Judd, let me ask you an interesting question. It's something, uh, uh, when, when you're receiving glass and you do your project and you send it back, um, what kind of insurance is required for that type of project? Well, to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not completely sure on that one. Uh, you know, again, my employer, I'm sure they have, you know, everything okay. that's needed because they have to do the install work and everything. And, but uh, no, it's uh, pretty much just a, uh, I think with what we're doing, it's just, I think at one point, you know, you, you learn to trust each other. I mean, it's, it's kind of scary to think, you know, that I'm handling with what I do. I'm handling, you know, thousands of dollars worth of you yeah. know, work and everything. So I always, I'm in a good situation in that I physically can take this glass. We pack it up in boxes. I deliver it, you know, by hand. Oh, uh, okay. So you're not putting it in the mail and shipping it. Oh, no. <laughs> So, okay. uh, and actually, when it comes to shipping, it's it's easier to send pieces. Now, I have had a few people, even from overseas, want me to do work for them. But it's like, how in the world do we ship something like this? Uh, because, like I said, if the if the window is already put together as a panel and it's a large panel, well, now you have to have it in some kind of a wooden crate, and it's got to be standing upright on a pallet. And, you just hope that somebody don't run a forklift through it or something like that. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, I mean, it just is way, you know, just really a lot of risk. Yeah. But now it's just uh, sending pieces, even, you know, shipping just the pieces. A lot of times that's easier done, mm -hmm. but you still, it is difficult because even I do some mailing of my original artwork, you know, to my employer and he puts some, I do my work mostly smaller scale because I'm, I, you know, I, I'm a detail guy and I can draw. I like doing it smaller instead of having to deal with a piece of paper that's, you know, 18 feet high and you know, <laughs> where do you draw it at and how do you keep it? And nowadays, you know, we have, you know, copy machines. So, you know, you can just take and blow it up and they don't really have to work on top of my originals. Or, yep. And if there's changes that have to be made, which sometimes the committee will come back after you've done the final work, and they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, well, we this, you know, changed and that. So, you know, sometimes we just have to improvise and, you know, work with those changes as well. But, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. You have, on this one project right now, you have 60 images, right? I mean, uh, 60 image windows you're making. Um, as a little side project for yourself, potentially, once you have all of those drawings done, and then maybe, I don't know if you're doing little studies and those kinds of things, but all of that resource, I could see you putting that into a beautiful little book that, um, you know, uh, you, 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 you could then potentially sell to the people in that congregation or other, you know, or just to your people who are interested in your work. Um, you were talking about doing prints before and uh, I could totally see like, you know, a, a wonderful little coffee book being made out of uh, just out of the process of, of, of building that thing. Yes, that is one of my goals. And 
Unfortunately, where I stand in my journey at the moment is, again, it's just so time consuming to do what I do here. You know, I do wish it. And sometimes I wish I had somebody that was able to take that part of it on and, you know, take care of it. And again, you know, to me, it would be, I think it would be a great sideline business, Mm -hmm. even just selling prints, things like that, that are a little more affordable. Yep. My goal is to get there, but right now I'm struggling so hard just to keep up with the work and, you know, doing the work. And oh. uh, also it's just, uh, you know, uh, just keeping it, uh, you know, when somebody wants to buy one, well, now somebody's got to mail it and do all this. Well, yeah. I, just, I haven't had the time to deal with all that stuff. And again, I've tried to keep my business very simple Mm-hmm. For that very fact that I'm just not, it's not something that I, I want to spend all of my time on, you know? Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we do have to do it. And, well, when you, when you're, when you have these images done, um, contact me, I'll, I'll put your book together <laughs> for yeah, you. Well, I know uh, there's uh, the church that we're doing this for. Their intent is they, they do plan to have a book with nice. all, you know, the finished windows and the photographs and so forth. But I, I, I would think even for my purposes, I would just love to do even a coloring book. Or I know, know, right? You yeah. know, I'm sure it would be marketable to certain people. Like, again, the type of artwork I'm doing is – you know, again, a lot of it's a high Catholic art form kind yep. of thing, you know, so that would be my target audience pretty much. Indeed. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't necessarily want a picture of St. Thomas Aquinas. They wouldn't even know <laughs> what it was, you know, but then there's certain scenes like, I said, like the Last Supper. Well, that's a popular one for anybody. You know? yep. I mean, yeah. you know, some of the cartoons, I guess, are a lot more marketable than others. If you sell them individually like that, it would be harder. But I love the idea of the coloring book because the style it just suits itself for that. Um, one of the one of the the artists that I work with, um, she's a, a portrait painter, but she also is Catholic, and um, and she's starting to move into uh, doing these more religious theme paintings. So she just did a mother of salvation painting and, and now um, uh, she's doing something with the, the, the local parish um, that's around her. Uh, and she has a couple other paintings that she's working on that, that will be coming out, but she's really starting to want to move in that direction and provide artwork for Catholics. And, um, and so as she does that, maybe you and I and her can have some conversations and, and there's another, you know, product that we could build together to, to get out to that market um, without sucking up all your time, obviously, because that's, that's the whole point. You don't want to be spending your life on that. Um, Judd, so let me ask you, like, how in the world did you – go from comics this desire for comics and then like what was the process like how did you stumble into what it is that you do today like what's well, the journey I, of it? well i will try to put together a short answer like <laughs> you know it, it's, it kind of gets clouded uh yeah again up until i was out of high school, all I had on my mind was comic book art, but I actually had a chance to talk to a real comic book artist, and he was telling me about all the lonely hours in the studio, even if you could get in. And generally, you know, it's kind of like being an actor. Some other actor can't necessarily get you your success, you know, and help you get the job, you know. Mm. Like. So I really have no formal training at all, hardly to speak of, at least in the early years. I mean, I've never been to art school or college. I just, I mean, from the time I was little, I mean, I always knew that that was what I had to do. It was who I am. And my dad and my granddad, they were both good at drawing, but, Mm. and everybody tells me that, oh, you just came out of the womb being able to draw, you know, and it's like, (laughs) I really don't believe that. I think, 
you know, every child begins drawing, and that same thing happened with me. I scribbled like anybody else. But the thing that was different about me was I just couldn't get away from it. At one point, kids, you know, they start, you know, into grade school, and they get in with their friends, and, they, you know, it, it kind of takes them away or, yep. you know, they get involved in other things. But uh, generally, I got out of high school, and I met – uh, a local fellow that was living over on the lake and he did painting on glass. And I, I'm from a really small town. So I was thinking, boy, isn't this weird, you know? <laughs> and this is not to cut down glass painters in any manner, but a lot of glass painters are more like really experienced technicians. Mm. In other words, they they know how to paint on glass, but many of them do not have the ability to draw like that. I mean, if you give them an image of something out of a Bible or something like that, well, they can, you know, they can take and interpret that, especially the higher the level of the painter. But anyway, so early on, I got into, uh, you know, mainly doing artwork for him, but I began seeing some of his processes and uh, I really, I just early on, I said, boy, this ain't for me, you know, because you have to mix your paint and, uh, on a palette, you know, it comes in a powder form and you have to mix it for 15 minutes. And, you know, you have to add a binder and other things and just like, it's like, you know, this Work. whole process, <laughs> like, oh, I don't want none of this. But anyway, so got out on my own, moved up here to Huntsville and you know, I started working for some little small studio over here and she wanted me to, she like, you know, a lot of people early on used me for the drawing, mm -hmm. my skill with drawing and, and they were doing painting. And so, they, so they used you to, to basically give them the edge in terms of originality and, and artistry. All of this custom artwork because everything we do nearly yeah. so custom you just wouldn't believe i mean it's like people that pay that kind of money and, and again you know with churches and all well you know yeah these windows are expensive but generally they are paying for these windows as a big group of people and mm -hmm. they're having something that becomes a part of the history of the congregation or or wherever and it uh you know so it's almost like people can pool their money, whereas even today, an individual, if you were to say, hey, Judd, you know, uh, what, what would you charge me to do a stained glass window and I want this and that? Well, you know, a lot of people, just individuals, they would have to really want it bad, like it was a sports car or something <laughs> to be able to afford it, you know, because it's just so much labor. And again, we live in an age where people don't really, like I said, you can get things off of eBay now, you know, and it'll mm -hmm. stained glass, you know, when it's uh, painted glass, real painted glass, it's, you know, they're selling it for $55. Well, you know, people like me, I know the difference. There's no way somebody can be doing something like that and charge $55. I mean, I mean you know, uh, yep. so I know all the subtle trees and the differences. So I can look at a lot of that stuff and tell you, no, that's not real. That's somebody's, you know, printed on glass or done some faux process or whatever, you know? Yeah. Hmm. But, uh, but just to uh, I, finish yeah, our, on. our thing here, I uh, pretty much, uh, no, I, I got my first job working at a stained glass studio. I helped out as an installer and I began building windows and that was my only job at that time at that studio. In the meantime, I was trying to make it with the fine art, and I think I had my first gallery show. It was a great disappointment, didn't really sell a thing, and, you know, you just really get depressed as an artist. And I just kind of thought about it in the back of my head. I said, you know, if I could learn to paint on glass, I might possibly have a chance because at least it's such a rare art form. There's so few people that do it. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, even today, I still really wrestle with the art form. To me, it's just the most complicated thing ever. I mean, it's just all the, you know, the difference in the way it looks when you fire it as opposed to what it looks like on the table when you're working on it. You know, again, you know, you can say you find 
what you think is that perfect flesh tone. Well, now you put it up in the yellow sunlight and it turns way too orange. Mm. This is the kind of thing we have to deal with. Like in, in canvas painting or whatever, it's almost like it's made to be seen in reflected light. So what you see is kind of what you get. But with what we do, it's just like I was painting one of Adam and Eve here not long ago, and the, the committee said, no, we want these people to look Middle Eastern, you know, with the flash tones. And I'm like, okay. And so anything I do that's different, I have to test it and try to, you know, sometimes, you know, make test firings and hold it up in the light and see what it's going to look like. Because mm. if it's facing south, it gets one type of light. If it's facing north, Wow, so that's incredible. Light and, you know, so... And, and, and are you taking notes the entire time that you do this so that you know what pigments well, you... Unfortunately, need? there's just not a lot of time to experiment. So mm. I started on this one and I got painted and painting on it and I took it outside to look at it. I, I made my best judgment from a few tests that I did and I got outside and I looked at it and it just looked way too orange. It didn't mm. sound I said, oh, no, because, you know, you really can't afford to go back. And all you can do is keep adding paint. And mm -hmm. finally, I had to take like a color like it's called black green grisaille, yeah. which yep. is a black green color. And I wound up putting that, just a flat wash of it all over the whole back of it. Yeah. And, and it seemed to sort of fix the problem. But it's, it's like I said, it, it just kind of still you really never know the results until it's in its place. Yep. Yep. You know, I work off of live tables. So a lot of times yeah. that's kind of cheating in a sense. It don't really show you, you know, what's the real of it, you know, because the lighting is constant and it's got a white background. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now the, the light that you use in there, is that a, like a, a UV light or, or is that just regular fluorescence or? I have always using fluorescent in my main table, and but now I've kind of switched over to the LED. Mm. But really, you know, I really need to spend some good money and get me a <laughs> one that's better lit because I'm using mainly like a light fixture turned upside down. Yeah. And, uh, so that puts the light through, but it's a different kind of light than that would be shining through. Or, yeah. or are you using the um, the uh, the sunlight bulbs, like daylight you know, bulbs, yeah. Uh, well, again, I was just kind of taking a risk with the new one. When I use the fluorescence, I, I like to use the daylight bulbs. Okay, gotcha. But, uh, That's cool, man. I, I, I uh, the other challenge is some of the glass, like you get colors like red, and it really eats up the light. So if you get mm. like a real dark red glass and you're trying to paint layers of paint on top of it on the table, it just looks so dark you can't even see through the glass. You know, it's like, oh. Mm. So it makes it real difficult. And sometimes, you know, I feel like I need like one of these tables that get brighter and brighter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it, when, when that gets so dark, it, it does, does it feel like, oh, there's a mistake there? Like, because light's not really, because it becomes so opaque that the light's not shining through? Uh, yeah, essentially. I, I have actually even seen some colors of glass that uh, actually I had one piece of red one time from one particular supplier and I put it in the kiln to fire it and it turned out this, it was a transparent dark red, but when I fired it, glass itself turned orange and it was not see-through at all so this is the kind okay. of thing you know if you're a glass painter i tell people you have to be it's almost like i consider i'm i'm uh cleaning the kitchen all the time kind of you know i have uh -huh. a workspace sort of clean and then i'm Part of me is you know puzzles i'm dealing with puzzle pieces it's just it's just a very you know labor intensive art form Hmm. Uh, like you said, you really get the real effect when you see it, of course, put together, and, and uh, that's the that's the difference. That's awesome, man. Um, so, if if you were going to see yourself five, ten years from now, ideally, where where would you be with your stained glass? 
Well, I think, you know, and I will say that I'm very happy and pleased to work and, and doing the things that I do, but I do feel like, like any artist, I would, you know, I would love to be doing whatever suited my fancy. I love the King Arthur legends. I love a lot of different things, you know, and that would be the type of theme work I would love to just be able to do. But generally, again, the, the stained glass is made usually, most everything is done is custom. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got a bathroom. Can you make a window for my bathroom? So mm -hmm. it's almost like little bitty small panels and things you know, to one degree, people look at them as though they're just, you know, cheap and shoddy, you know, little light catchers, they call them, you know. <laughs> I mean, they just don't see the work in them. So it's very difficult to get, you know, to, to, to go down that road. But I just, I love, I would love to be doing, you know, things from classical literature and other, other things. I think the Victorian period saw you know, just every kind of glass you could imagine. I mean, back during that time, people were buying it in their house and it was in the stair landing. And, you know, yep. there were a lot of people that even did glass painting, but they did, you know, just the most fabulous, you know, birds and butterflies and, you know, different things. And it just, you know, just the, anything you could imagine nearly was painted in glass during that period and people supported it and bought it. But, yep. You know, like you said, now it's like, uh, you know, just it's, so much harder to do that. It seems like, again, you know, the most call for work is in churches. I think there are a lot of art galleries and things that are beginning to get onto it, but they're usually like artificially backlit, and most of the time, galleries want wall space. So mm -hmm. How do you how do you light these panels? You know, if you're trying to get them in a natural situation, they have to have light coming through them from a window or something else. And so it gets to be kind of problematic. But, yeah. Uh, so let, let, let me, let me, let me ask you this question in terms of the light, the, the stained glass, when you want to do, let's say the King Arthur series, right. Yeah. Um, or things from literature. What part of the process or what part, yeah, what part of the process is it that you really love doing that you want to do? Um, and, and the reason why I'm asking that is, um, is it the actual final product of having that artwork on glass that's, that, that's what's important to you? Um, or could, could the medium shift even a little bit? and be something else, but the process be very similar? I think with any artist, I think it's the journey and the mm. process. I love, again, there's part of me that sometimes I feel like, why am I even a glass painter? I don't want to cut myself down. I'm happy with what I do, but it's just like, for me, the painting is a big process and it's, I don't feel like I'm, I don't know a, Everybody calls me master, but I don't know that I'll ever gain mastery of it. It's just, you know, I mean, to me, my thing is I've always been good with drawing. That's where my heart really is. In a sense. Yeah. That's where I feel like I can really shine. I mean, I can, and, uh, you know, but I love like making up these costumes and just really, you know, it's the imagination and being able to, you know, come up with something different. That's another thing, like with the church windows and things, it's almost like, you know, how many different versions of the Last Supper can you do? It's almost like there's always, you know, the 12 apostles and Jesus in the middle at a table with, you know, the bread and the grapes. I mean, what could you do that's really imaginative or any different? That's pretty much the thing, you know? So I like stuff where you can just really delve in and, you know, just really, you know, just really create something artistic out of your head you know and absolutely and and that's why i was kind of challenging you on this um because you brought up i think you said uh, um uh stevie nicks right from yeah like that. it's one of the things that i'm putting my effort in my life into is in the art world reestablishing this idea that there is the composer and the idea maker and then there's the executors. 
And creating an environment for painters, what I call performers, right, um, who might, who, who may be absolutely highly skilled and in love with the craft of painting, but might struggle with coming up with an original idea, right? Because a lot of painters, they, they, they find really great photos and then they paint them. Um, yeah. they're, not con- they're not conjuring an idea and then composing and designing and drawing that out and, and working out those issues and then painting. Uh, obviously, there are many painters who do do that. And I'm kind of curious, like what I, what I find amazing outside the fact that you do this on glass is your drawings. Like your drawings are so well designed and, and then on top of it, you have this old German style as well, right? That you, you, you're able to draw in. And I look at that, I'm like, the way that you do hair, the way that you're doing fabric, like it's highly stylized, and, but it's highly designed. And, and it just works so well that I wonder what that would look like if you gave that to a painter and had them paint, right? But you supplied the music they just performed it in their instrument. And, um, and w- what are your thoughts about that kind of approach? Well, I think it could be interesting. And uh, uh, I think that there's, uh, I don't know, like I say, ultimately, you know, there's, there's so many stages to painting on glass. I think I don't want to shoot myself in the foot because I'm glad to do this for a living and I, you know, I want to keep developing the glass painting, but you know, it's uh, like I said, it's kind of nice to be able to draw your own windows and then, you know, actually, you know, paint them on glass, you know, mm-hmm. I'm copying in a sense, but I'm copying from my own work, you know, it's not like I, you know, and, yeah. uh, but you know, when I look at a lot of the old windows and the old things, it just seemed like that was what was different about them. They had that hand of the original artist. And they mm. weren't always intended to look photorealistic. That wasn't really even, you know, the That's thing. It yeah. is, and it's just a more, you know, a little bit of a heightened stylization. In other words, if I'm doing a rock, how can I really make this rock look like, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, really sharp and up in your face, you know, <laughs> what can I do to give it, you know, like I said, this old style I'm working in was called sort of German Baroque. If you look at a lot of Baroque sculpture, you know, they have these rays shooting out of the head for the halo. They have mm-hmm. all this ornament in them and everything. And, uh, that, and that was it. It was just a little bit over the top, you know, kind of thing. And but, uh, I think I'm steering away from your question, though. I apologize. What were you... No, no, that that's fine. But like you did the one painting, and um, I, I, you had the little dove, and I, I guess the God figure, and then Jesus, and I like the design behind the Jesus's head, which was this kind of a circle with this beam coming through it. Um, oh, I think you also did, unless I'm thinking of a different image, but I believe you did an image where you had Mary, baby Jesus. There were a couple. Um, animals and I, and, I, and I believe it was Joseph behind her yeah. and you had this this ray of light this, this these rays right like a sunbeams or whatever but what was very interesting is they didn't come from the center of the three characters they radiated from behind the characters but ultimately all the lines came to um, baby Jesus right yeah uh, I, I, I think that was one of your paintings, unless I was looking at some masterworks or something. No, um, there was a one window that uh, we did. And again, I just have to tell you, in my case, it's not that I could not be designing all of these and everything myself, but again, it's a big process. So I have to give credit to my employer mm. in the sense of some of his, or, you know, his designs and the things that he does. Once the work is turned over to me, I'm just, I, I see my job really is turning the artwork more into the requested style. You know, this, this I gotcha. church we're working for, they wanted these old German windows and it's almost like, uh, you know, 
they're really, they're just very few people that can, I mean, I don't even think, I, I mean, I'm doing the best I can, but I, I look at my work compared to theirs and I think, you know, I'm like, well, I got a long way to go. I mean, <laughs> those guys were just so good, you know. It's, it's like, and if most better. people were around you, they would think you're crazy. Like, what you talking about, man? You're a master. <laughs> but no, my employer, he has a very good sense of design. Uh, mm. What you run into with a lot of uh and I do have, you know, if you were to go back to my page, you know, there are certain windows that I have designed and that there have been a few, especially when I first started freelancing. I did one of the Lady of the Lake from the King Arthur Legends. Mm. Uh, and that one won me like a, it was totally, completely out of my head, you know, or what I wanted to do with it. And it was just one of those, you know, do it for fun. Of course, I didn't have any work at the time and I was <laughs> So, you know, that's the other thing is sometimes all of this takes so much work. It's almost like as an artist, you kind of have to, you know, just do the best you can and move on. It's like, I don't have time to sit around really. And just, you know, I could beat myself up and say, Oh, I don't like the way I drew that leg or I, you know, but at one point, once it's time to work, you just got to go, you know, and yep. you know, you can't afford to, I mean, it takes long enough, no matter what you do. So it's like, uh, you know, you just have to move on and say, well, I'll be doing better with the next one. And, you know, and I, like I said, I'm proud of my work, but I just feel there's always other people that you look up to you know, more than yourself, even, you know. Mm-hmm. But I yeah. think the difference is, is when you're doing it for like the Lady of the Lake panel, like I said, that was just fun. I didn't have any time constraints. I was able to just do whatever I wanted. I think that's what any real artist wants. Indeed. Uh, but again, uh, you know, when you're doing this for a living, it becomes, you know, well, how, you know, I mean, I, I would say I have a, have probably the most quality control of anybody I can think of. But it's on the other hand, it's always about how quick can I get through so I can get my next check? And, you know, yep. I mean, to some degree, but now having said that, I think what I'm doing is very extreme quality and I, I don't apologize for that at all. But, but again, it's just the mentality, you know, it's like, you know, the mentality today is try to keep it simple and whether you're getting a contractor to do work on your house, whatever you're doing, you know, it's like, you know, keep it simple, get in there, do the job, get out. And I'm dealing with one. I think when you deal with artists, you know, you're dealing with one of the few people left in the world that if you give them a commission, I would say nine times out of 10, or at least any artist I know, they bend over backwards to give 250%. Mm -hmm. And like I said, everybody else, it seems like, whether they're you know, in landscaping or whatever they do, it's it's almost like, you know, they get in and they want to do the job just to get the money as quick as they can. And if, if you can't afford to give them $15,000 job, they don't even want to knock, you know, don't even want the job. And that's the kind of world we live in. But I just, I, I find it interesting that I think, you know, artists or those people that are still, you know, they will give everything to try to do the best work they can do, you know? Yeah, because it's it's who they are. Whether we're getting paid for it or not. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, we just want to do great work. You know? Yep. Yep. It's funny, my, my brother's a, a magician and um years ago he, he would say I I do the magic show for free, <laughs> you know. But I but but I get paid for the 10 hour driving, you know, trip to drive there. And then the six hours of loading in and setting up and, you know, like just, you know, just all the other stuff that goes around having a, you know, for him to have that hour of doing magic at the end of the night. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, I'm looking at some of your work again here on your Facebook page. So if anyone's listening to this, you know, go, go to, uh, judge, uh, facebook page and we'll put that in the show notes i'll put a link in there um it, it's just gorgeous work man just incredible and it's just and then when you add the factor that this is on glass and then you add the fact that it it's these beautiful illustrations 
And then they're brilliantly engineered to actually be broken up into pieces, right? So like I'm looking at this uh, rabbi or I'm assuming he's a rabbi, um, this priest. And, uh, and I'm looking at just his turban and I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, five pieces of glass just to build out that turban. But then within each piece of glass, there's the, this beautiful drawing that occurs. Um, and it's not even colored, uh, at, at least at, not at the point of the, 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 the photo. Um, but yeah, there's just so much. And, and you know what I really like about your work is when you look at the flesh or the hair, um, the the grace in the lines, and obviously you're quote unquote copying the style of this Munich or this German Baroque, but the fact that you're actually doing it, it it's just beautiful, man. It's it's very cool, and, and and you when you look at the skin, you can almost you, you can feel like I don't know if it's pencil marks you're making or something, but there's just this you can almost feel the texture of the skin wrapping around the, the, the form. And um, very cool, very cool stuff. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting medium for sure. <laughs> so, um, Judd, let me ask you, uh, I think... Um, I'm gonna. We're probably gonna wrap the the conversation up here in a, in a minute, um, but uh, before I ask people, I mean, I'll ask you where how people can get in contact with you if they want to connect and see see more of your work. Um, let me ask you the most important question I'm gonna ask you for in this entire conversation. Question I ask everybody: um, When you're in your studio. And you're working hard and you're putting this stuff in the kiln and you're out there looking in the sun and you have to mix paints and you have to like all of this, not only physical work that goes into it, but also all of this brain work that has to go into it. Um, and you're using up all of these calories and now your body's feeling fatigued and it's saying, feed me. My question for you is, what in those moments do you love to eat? Okay. What do you, what do I love to eat? Yeah. When you're like, oh. you've worked hard and now, now your body is like, feed me. What do you, what, what, what do you, what's your go-to food? Uh, well, I, I find it sort of a luxury to just have time to cook every now and then. I, you know, <laughs> But uh, I don't know. I'm into. I like a lot of Middle Eastern cuisine. Uh, really? Yeah, and uh, you know, I try to be because, again, the nature of my work is such that, you know, I mean, I'm all I've got. So I try to be a little more on the healthier eating side. Now, I mean, I'll go and splurge and have a pizza and this and that every now and then. And I'm certainly not vegetarian, but uh, <laughs> you know. But again, uh, you know. Um, I don't know. I think for me, a lot of times I wind up having to just get out of the studio and, and go grab something somewhere, you know, just uh, this close. I'm within walking distance of a few places, and sometimes it's just good to get out and enjoy anything. But, go for uh, a nice little walk. Now, when you when you eat Mediterranean food, what, like, is there a place that's near you? Well, I actually, you know, I fix some of it myself, but yeah, I have a hero place next to me over here and they have uh, the, you know the grape leaves and that type of thing ro rolled grape leaves and uh -huh. that kind of stuff so it's just something that's kind of you know, quick and <laughs> something to grab you know that's, that's uh, cool made. And, and like how did you do you remember like how you stumbled into Mediterranean food uh because I'm sorry man like your 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 thick southern accent, being in Alabama, it when you say Mediterranean food, it's like what? Like, yeah. like where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, no, uh, you know, I just uh, 
I think I was visiting over in Germany one time and I had a friend of mine I was staying with you know, on the military base and uh -huh. over there and they had these donor kebab yeah. sandwiches and I was like, oh, oh, this God. is really good, you know. <laughs> I ate, when I lived in Portugal, I ate those things. Like I was there for five months. It took me about three and a half months before I found them. I walked by them all the time. I didn't really know what they were. And one day I went in and then I ate in those things one to two times a day, every day, those little donor kebabs. Oh my God. I miss them yeah. so much. <laughs> and it's one of those things that to me, that kind of meat is sort of rare and you can't, you know, you can't buy it just anywhere. You can't yep. hardly go to the grocery store and get that rotisserie beef, you know, that spiced beef. And uh, I even looked it up on the internet. I thought, oh, they got everything you can find on the internet. I'll look it up and make my own, you know, from lamb and beef. Yep. And, and uh, you know, I fixed one and it it turned out didn't taste anything like, you know, <laughs> like I was so disappointed, you know, because I spent a lot of money, you know. <laughs> oh, you I bought the, the, the rotisserie like, machine? You know. You, you, you uh, bought the machine? No, I didn't buy the machine. No, this was some kind of oven, you know, you put it in the oven. But I, oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. But I like, uh, no, I like a lot of multicultural type foods, you know, cuisine stuff. That's cool, man. <laughs> That's awesome. I really get uh, German food. I really love German food, even though it's kind of heavy, but that's, indeed. that's one of my favorites. Nice, nice. Now, when you say German food, do you mean the liquid food? the beer <laughs> no just uh you know uh, just uh like i said just uh, their cuisine you know yeah sauerkraut bratwurst exactly I, I i'm i was raised in pennsylvania so heavy pennsylvania dutch german area and uh so i agree with you man like good german food <laughs> and uh yeah well judd it was a great conversation, man. And I thank you for taking me through your journey. Um, I, I just find you and your work absolutely fascinating. And, um, and it was just a treasure to find somebody who does this kind of work. And um, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the interview and we will see where we are 10 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh Maybe we'll have a, a donor kebab restaurant with stained glass windows on the on the outside. Um. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. In just 30 days, the Core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven day no hassle money back guarantee at core80.com.